Welcome back to the podcast daily. I'm Bill Landis. That's Jeremy Birmingham. We appreciate you joining us here on a Monday morning after a big time Ohio State win 20 to 12 over Penn State. Weird score. Is that score Agami? Did we check 20 to 12? Is that score? I know it's the mine apocalypse. Is that score Agami? Uh, I don't think it is. It seems like something that has probably happened before. Okay. If it would have been like 19 to 11, maybe. But yeah, twenty to twelve, I guess, is, I guess is pretty common. All right, so I've got a lot of notes. Burns got a lot of notes. We have both rewatched the game. We're going to go position by position, like we do always on the Monday podcast rewatch daily, whatever this thing is called. Uh, but we're going to start with a defense this time because they deserve it. They played a heck of a game. Jim Knowles on Sunday tweeted out the silver bullet of the day, and it was everybody, which is like a new thing that he's unbelievable. Are we in that world now where everyone gets a damn trophy? <laughs> this defense deserves it berm incredible uh it was pretty good um yeah you know on re-watching it i mean we can go position by position but let me just start with this note here penn state had 161 yards in the first half they had 73 yards on the final drive of the game that they scored their only touchdown and between those 161 and those 73 they had six yards <laughs> That's, that's not a lot of yards and a lot of football time being played yeah that is unbelievable um six yards on i think six drives between those two situations drew aller was 10 of 30 at one point in this game like that was an absolute clinic put on by jim Knowles and his defense and it started up front uh we went into the game i think bill expecting it to be the interior of the defensive line doing the job and then it ended up being exactly the same guy who it was a year ago and JT Tumalo just absolutely wrecking what Penn State was doing. It doesn't show up in the stat book like it did a year ago where he had six tackles and two interceptions and a forced fumble and a and a deflected pass that was another like but every single time Penn State needed a play, JT Tumalo seemed to be the guy ruining it. Yeah. Um he had a really good game. I agree with you. I think I might have said in the post game show, like if you just look at the stat book, if that's all you're doing is checking stats and you didn't watch the game, maybe you think that JT is not very good or didn't have much of an impact on this game. I thought from the jump he was kind of wrecking what Penn State wanted to do, as as you said, and made himself some some dollars in the process with the way that he played against Olu Fashanu, the, the left tackle from Penn State. Um, that guy's going to be a top 10 pick probably in the 2024 NFL draft. And JT looked like a guy who might also be a top 10 pick in the 2024 right. NFL draft. I thought he more often than not was giving that guy the business. I think that's the question people had about JT after last year's game because it was admittedly against the backup tackle for Penn State in that mm -hmm. game. Uh, I thought JT acquitted himself pretty nicely against Joe Ald at Notre Dame. I'd consider that one more of like a stalemate for that game than than what I thought was a clear advantage to JT Tumalo out in this game over Olu Fashanu. Um, the he had obviously the sack that he did get at the first play of the fourth quarter wasn't blocked, which is a bad idea. Purdue did the same thing a week ago and tried to like think that they could sprint the other way fast enough to get away from him. I don't think people truly grasp how athletic JT Tumaloa is uh, because he's not out there as a true edge rusher all the time. But when it's just a pin your hair back and go get them type of play, JT has some major, major acceleration. Um, but the fourth and seven for uh, Penn State with the seven minutes to go in the game, he pushes Fashanu back into Aller and, and deflects the pass. He was just all over the place. Earlier in the game, Penn State tried to run a screen to JT Tumaloa outside. Like, did they watch last year's film? It was yeah. the same. It, it was very puzzling. Like it's the second drive of the game. You went three and out on your first drive, and your second drive, you decide to throw a screen or try to throw a screen right at the guy who intercepted two passes at the line of scrimmage a year ago, uh, which didn't seem to be a good idea. Yeah, I actually texted that play to our tech subscribers on Sunday afternoon as I was going through rewatching the game because it just goes in the stat book as an incomplete pass. But I thought it was. A, a terrific example, I think, of like JT's play recognition, his feel for space. He he got upfield a little bit, felt the offensive tackle kind of disengage from him, mm -hmm. saw the tight end release, and just like jumped in the throw window. And then Drew Aller just had to spoil the ball and, and throw it out of bounds. And that's like yeah. it's not a sexy play, but it's a play that blew up an opportunity where Penn State was trying to do something simple and get a big gain out of it. They couldn't do it, and it set them back mm -hmm. off schedule again, which is what this defense did time and again 
on first and second down in this game, I thought they were pretty good. There, there were some big gains on first and second down that like tweak the averages a little bit. But I wrote this in my in the five thoughts that I had at, at OhioStateRivals.com. 19 of 29, I believe, first and second down plays for Penn State went for like no gain or negative yardage, which is kind of insane. So and JT had it. Yeah, we can we can talk about why that is probably a little bit more later because I think that falls squarely on Mike Gersuch. But um, yeah, you know, JT started this game drawing a hold on the third play of the game by Penn State, which never happens against Caden Wallace. Uh, and it sort of set the tone for me right then that it, he was going to be in charge because uh, Penn State had a, a manageable third down on the first drive. And then he goes out and stuffs it, uh, draws the hold after the incomplete pass, forces the punt. Um, and then on the second series, as I, I, I wrote down here, don't throw a score to JT. He has an absolutely incredible feel for the game. But then that was on second down on that play or on that that drive and on third down i don't they actually let jt run a stunt which he almost never does and like forced uh, uh you know him getting up the middle along with michael hall forced uh aller to throw off his back foot and late there or early there sorry and i thought that it was like those first two possessions where the defensive line made Drew Aller's clock speed up way faster than it normally does, and I don't think he ever recovered from that. Yeah, uh, just quickly to correct myself, it was 19 out of 49, not 19 out of 29. It was still pretty good. Um, I love those stunts they were running. They they did a couple with JT to get him up the middle. Caden Curry got up the middle one time on one of those, and I, th- I thought hit Drew Aller like, in a way that just like kind of disrupted the pass, like wasn't a sack, wasn't a TFL, maybe got there a half mm-hmm. second late, but it was in Drew Aller's face and then forced forced a bad throw. And I, I agree with you. I think they kind of set the tone early. Um, they were really good against the run, I, I, I thought. There were a couple of runs that got out, but for the most part, I thought they, they were good against the run. But it just felt like they were collapsing the pocket a lot. Even when they weren't sacking Drew Aller, they were, they were around him, and it seemed like he felt that, and it was kind of throwing off the timing of everything he wanted to do for the entire game. Yeah, they were fine against the run. The defensive line was uh, Penn State again. This is I'm sure you can listen to a Penn State podcast if you're interested in hearing people bash Mike Hirsich. But the Penn State's third drive of the game, on you know you get Nick Singleton on the first carry, 20 yards straight up the gut. Sonny mm-hmm. Siles probably saves a touchdown on that play by just yep. his athleticism. You get 15 on the next play, uh, run play to Nick Singleton, and all of a sudden it feels like uh, what's going on here. And then they just decided to start throwing the ball again. And it was so obvious to me that what JT Tumaloa, what Michael Hall and Tyreek Williams were doing up the middle, and what Kenyatta Jackson started to do in the third drive of the game for Ohio State was getting to Aller. And then they were doing a great job mixing in the blitzes with the linebackers, Sonny Styles getting a blitz. Like, it was just a master class by Jim Knowles at doing the unexpected and you know, it actually was probably the first time all year where I where I've noticed it on film anyway, where they actually ran zero blitzes and did other things mm-hmm. with the defense. But that only happened later in the game once the tone had been so well established that there was nothing Aller could could get out of his head. Um, I thought this was Ty Hamilton's best game um, against the run. If you if you go back and watch some, like there there were those big hits in the run game. You're right, like and you want to get those cleaned up, but far far more of Penn State's runs went for like less than three yards. Yeah, and the, run, the, the runs that got strung out to the edge a lot were Ty Hamilton just like working the center or working the guard and driving that guy into the backfield and just kind of blowing the thing up before it got started. And then the other guys clean it up. So like Ty Hamilton doesn't end up with a boatload of stats, but I thought he he was good resetting the line of scrimmage in this game. I think resetting is the right word for the Ohio State defense, and that's what they did the entire game. Um, because you look at Nick Singleton, those first three carries he had, he had 20 yards, 15 yards, and then seven yards on the third and 15 that Penn State had before they kicked a field goal. So that's what 30, 42 yards in his first three carries. He ends up he ends up with nine carries for 49 yards. Uh, so he had 42 yards on his first three, and then seven yards on his next six. And uh, the Buckeyes just put a clamp on it, and it starts up front. But you know, I think after a couple weeks of being somewhat um, maligned. This was a much improved game for Tommy Eichenberg, for Steel Chambers, for Cody Simon, who's con- who's played well the last few weeks, but for Tommy especially, who the coaching staff has said in the last few weeks, he's playing fine. It's they weren't concerned about what Tommy was doing. But you and Doug talked about it on Wednesday on Kings of Columbus. Like this was an opportunity for Tommy to be more of that hammer, that downhill guy. Um, and he he, you know, he didn't always 
he didn't always end up making the tackle, but he did what he did a year ago and forced other guys to be or, uh, allowed other guys to be there because he was blowing things up at the point of attack. Yeah, I, th- I thought it was a pretty good game for the linebacker. Cer- certainly better than than it was the, the previous two weeks. Um, I'd, I'd include Cody and Simon in that too. Cody Simon had a huge um, yeah. run stop. It was after Jesse Murko flipped the field with that punt from the end zone. The first play of the game, they they sent Cody in on Penn State tried to run a counter play, and Cody I think just saw the tackle pull and just like blitzed it from the backside and took it down to the backfield for a loss of three and like set that drive back before it ever started. So it looked it looked like last year. I thought like those guys swarmed the ball pretty good. All three linebackers that played um, got off blocks. I think for for the most part, um, there were a couple of nice plays where Tommy just kind of like engaged the tackle and then kind of ditched them and, and made a tackle or, or got in late on a play. So it was good. And I, they had some looks too. I don't know if you noticed this. Where it was early on in the game maybe they stopped doing it later in the game where they would like widen tommy and steel and then drop sunny down into the middle like he was playing mike linebacker and i thought that was interesting i thought that they moved sunny around a lot um and you know we were talking all week about would he be, be out there more of that traditional sam role um the sack that he had he was basically lined up on the line of scrimmage right behind jt he was basically on jt's left hip and they both rushed the quarterback and, and forced the guy to force the running back to make a decision um, and Sonny, because he's big enough and strong enough to bring Aller down with one arm, was able to do it. I thought Penn State was so just out of sync offensively that they didn't do things that seemed like it would have worked. Um, <laughs> you you saw, I have it here on their 11, 11th drive, 12th drive, 11th drive of the game. So this is... Um, This is at, this is after the uh, after the Ohio State gets stopped on fourth down at the two, two yard line. Mm-hmm. Um, the first play that they ran there was a like a little or not the second down play was a little Texas route to Nick Singleton where he just put him out on an island against Steel Chambers and that picked up seven yards pretty easy. Tommy and and Lathan and Steel were able to bring him down like at a yard short of the first down. And then Buckeyes get off the field because Singleton dropped the ball on the little swing pass out there. But like, I think they could have used the running backs in the passing game a lot more than they did, which would have uh, really tested Ohio State a bit. But they didn't, and I think that was because they were just so worried about Aller not having time to throw the ball. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess we have to be fair about the game, right? Like Mark Beershich called a terrible game for <laughs> for, oh. for, for, for Penn oh. State. <laughs> Um, and I think Penn State fans are pretty upset about that. Um, like they the few the handful of third and shorts they had, I think they threw the ball more than they ran the ball, which is kind of an odd decision, given with the position your quarterbacks in in that game. But I, I still give. I mean, Ohio State or yeah, Ohio State. I think took Penn State out of what it wanted to do to by putting them in a lot of third and longs or third and mediums that I just don't. I don't think they're equipped to convert. Penn State is so. Um, it was it was. A little bit of some and some of the other, like Mike Gersh has called a bad game. I thought Jim Knowles called a great game. And and when that yeah. happens, that's gonna that's what's gonna look like. But when it came down to plays where I think they both did something right, uh, so Penn State's fourth drive of the game, they have a third and one, they throw the ball. Ohio State had a zero blitz on there. They blitz Josh Proctor, who ends up jumping and tipping the ball. Jordan Hancock and Jermaine Matthews didn't pass off coverage. And if Proctor doesn't tip that ball, it's almost certainly a sixty five yard touchdown for Penn State on the slant and it's just those little things where maybe a year ago guys weren't exactly where they needed to be in that situation where you see the growth of the Ohio State defense because that was an opportunity at that point uh, it's 10 to 3 Ohio State and Penn State uh, I'm telling you if they connect on that play uh, it it's uh I'm sorry at that point it's 3 to 3 still sorry mm-hmm. um th- go back and watch that play it's the like I said Penn State's fourth drive Cover zero, Proctor blitzed, and uh, it was just a play where at that moment, your such actually seemed to have dialed up the right play, but Ohio State's veteran defense made a stop where maybe a year ago they wouldn't have. Yeah, I, no, I agree. I, I think that's been the case with, with the defense all year. It just seems like guys have, have a more instinctual feel, I think, for where they need to be and what offenses are trying to do. And then when Jim Knowles makes his adjustments too, they, they deploy them well and and quickly like there's not there's just there's not a lag period i think where high state's trying to figure out what they want to do on defense with when they when they give up a, a play or two they rebound like almost immediately and shut down drive so um anything else on linebackers before we move to the secondary no i mean i think they were pretty solid uh, they, tommy and Steele led the team in tackles cody had a nice game as I said i mean it's a group that we're going to see a lot more of in the next few weeks w- wisconsin 
Um, I imagine is going to try to run the ball as much as they can on Saturday because it seems folly at this point to try to pass against Ohio State when you don't have a truly dynamic outside option, and Wisconsin certainly doesn't. Michigan State, I don't think, even should show up. Um, <laughs> and, and Rutgers will run the ball a lot. So I think we're going to see a heavy dose of those guys the next few weeks. So there's an opportunity to get really healthy for those guys and get a lot of confidence heading into the end of November because you got four teams now that are going to run the ball like crazy in the next month, or there's an opportunity for those guys to get banged up because they're just getting, uh, you know, into a lot of head, head, head on head collisions. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's a good point to make. I, like maybe they dip into some linebacker depth here. I, I, I don't know. Um, by the way, someone texted into us and to, with a message for Brim Cantori that it's going to be cold and rainy in Madison. On Saturday, uh, night. yeah, it's supposed to be like in the low 40s with a chance of rain in the afternoon, early evening. Don't love that, especially because <laughs> here in beautiful Ohio, it's supposed to be in the like 70s all week. Yeah, yeah, it's rather nice here right now, but it doesn't sound like it's going to be all that nice in Madison. Um, and it, yeah. Wisconsin uh, came back and won that game against Illinois too. They scored yeah. 18 points, 18 unanswered, I think, in the fourth quarter of that game to win. So maybe they're feeling themselves. Could be an interesting game. Uh, so you're not going to let those boys quit. That's what you know yeah, about Luke. That's right. Uh, Secondary. Uh, I, let's start with safety because the first note I had for safety was that tip pass from from Josh Proctor on that intermediate third and one throw. Um, I I also wrote I can't believe they didn't run the ball on that <laughs> on that play, but uh, yeah, that was an incredible play by by Josh Proctor. What else stood to you stood out to you from the safety group? I mean, Josh had another one later in the game. Aller had a, a, a he was out of the pocket and escaping and. It's the, I think, third down play before the the JT tipped on fourth down, like where Josh nearly picked off the ball on the sideline. I mean, oh, yeah, they, just they, yeah. uh, they did a really good job. Lathan downfield. I mean, they. Uh, I thought that we saw Ohio State being much more aggressive with the safeties in the run blitz stuff and, and, and a little bit of uh, pressure, but it's pretty wild how much better this group is than a year ago uh, a, a, as a whole. And I think that uh, we don't oftentimes give individual coaches their flowers because we're off, you know, regularly critiquing the small things. But what Perry Eliano has done with that group and what he's getting out of veterans, what and and maybe maybe it's not Eliano. Who knows? Maybe it's just Lathan Ransom and Josh Proctor and these guys being veterans and and the freaky unicornness of Sonny Styles. But they have become a much more competent group, and I think that's why in this game, when with a little bit more on the line. You saw Jim Knowles be willing to take chances with them and put them out there in position say, hey, make a play here for me, um, and, and which he had not needed to do the first six weeks of the year, but then he did in this one without any sort of consequence. So yeah. uh, I thought that was just a really solid game from the safeties. I don't have like notes about any one play other than, as I said, Proctor uh, knocking that play, the ball off on the fourth and one. Um, but uh, he also Josh Proctor also had on Penn State's uh, first drive of the second half, um, another zero blitz where Proctor yep. on a third and short play comes up and and blows it up in the backfield. So yeah, right through the um, C gap, yeah, that's great. Of that first five minutes of the second half, first six minutes of the second half, like Penn State was getting everything to go the way they needed it to go, and the Ohio State defense allowed the Buckeyes to ride out that that little uncomfortable part of it, and that's led by the safeties. Because I don't know if you know this, it is a safety driven defense at Ohio State, so. I, am, I, I, want, I hate to see what happened to Jihad Carter. That didn't yeah, look good. Um, no. the, the rolled up leg. I would not be surprised if we don't see him for a while. Um, so that's unfortunate. Yeah, I, I'm only. I only mention this because they happen so infrequently that it kind of like stays in your mind. The 34 yard completion that, that Penn State did hit to tight end Theo Johnson. Um, I thought that was a little bit of a coverage bust from Lathan Ransom. Penn State did a good job of of using motion, I think, to manipulate the defense a little bit and kind of left it with nobody on the backside of the play where they kind of released the tight end late, but I thought Lathan, Lathan was just like really aggressive kind of playing to the, to the motion to that side and, and left a void there that, that Penn state exploited. But other than that, it was like the one blemish, I think on a day yeah. when the safeties played, played really well. Um, I also noted that play from Josh Proctor on the first drive of the second half. And then he also on the, um, was that the fourth down play? I can't remember. There was a, I can't remember if it was third or fourth down. Um, Ty Hamilton kind of, or no, Mike Hall was like kind of initiated blowing the play up, but then Josh Proctor was one of the guys that, that cleaned it up to, I think, end a drive. I, yeah. that was. Um, I have um, on that pass play to Theo Johnson, I, I actually think it was Sonny Styles who let him go and probably made the mistake there. 
Um, if you rewatch it, you'll tell me if maybe you see it differently. This time I thought Sonny was supposed to follow him and, and didn't. Mm. But that play should have never happened because JT Tumaloa was mugged and yeah, tackled. He um, was. Yeah. <laughs> and so and they showed it multiple times right in front of the official. And I'm we're not here to complain about officiating, but that was blatant and he got dragged down to the ground and Penn State's biggest play of the game should not have happened uh, because of that hold but uh, yeah I think that was sunny but either way there was a coverage bus there and the guys looked confused on that moment but maybe they were confused because their star defensive end was tackled in the backfield and everyone just let it go yeah they were just mesmerized uh let's uh let's bridge the gap between safety and cornerback by talking a little Jordan Hancock what do you think of his game I don't think you can just talk a little Jordan Hancock. <laughs> I think you need to talk a big Jordan Hancock because he has become like Sean Wade 2019. And uh, if you can get that sort of production and versatility out of a guy in that spot, it changes everything about the way the defense can can play. You have a, a guy who's playing a safety role with corner skills, and he is not afraid to hit people. I asked him about this after the game. Uh, and the rewatch isn't, you know, f- to go into what we talk about with guys at the stadium. But I asked Jordan, like, you are a guy who was watched last year. All of your classmates in the class of 2021 become important to Ohio State and to mm-hmm. step into key roles. And you were hurt the whole time. How, like, isn't this amazing? <laughs> like, to finally get this opportunity. And he said, that, you know, he just he he knew it was going to happen eventually. He just had to stay patient and, and knew that he'd get healthy and prove to people what he was. But I don't think people. Because that class had Jack Sawyer and JT Tumaloa and Kyle McCord and Mecca Buka, Marvin Harris, like Jordan Hancock was unequivocally the number one player on the defensive backfield list for Ohio State in that class, and he's finally proving it. And like I said, if if you can get a, a, a shutdown corner and a surefire tackler in the run game at at that spot, that slot spot, that's a huge, huge bonus for Ohio State, and it completely changes the way the defense can operate. So, like, coming into last year, right, all we heard about was Jordan Hancock, man, watch out for him, here he comes. And he got hurt. And then the end of the year, they kind of threw him out there and in a way that I think maybe wasn't all that fair to Jordan because he had not been practicing. He clearly wasn't himself. And when he played at the end of last year, there were some people who were like, what, is, what are you guys talking about? Like, what was all this Jordan Hancock hype about? This guy doesn't look like he's very good. This is what it was about. Like, you're, see, you're seeing it now. Um Second play of the game, he's playing outside corner. He drives on a curl route to Keandre Lambert Smith and knocks it away. And I think that is another play that got probably got in Drew Aller's head a little bit. I thought the coverage from the corners was was pretty sticky all game. And I know there were some completions on underneath stuff and a couple slants, but when those happened, the tackles were made. And otherwise, I thought Ohio State's cornerbacks were all over Penn State's receivers. And it started with Jordan Hancock on the second play of the game. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, this isn't a Penn State podcast but i'm pretty sure aller if he just throws it to the slot receiver there on a slant behind the linebackers gets an easy first down but because he's an inexperienced quarterback playing in a place that he's never had to deal with a crowd that was very very loud well done ohio state fans like i think that everything just gets a little out of step and Mm -hmm. i think that there's a lot of things to be gained from ohio state in this game but also i start to look ahead to drew aller next year when he gets into these moments down the road like he's going to be a lot better than he was sure um and uh but the defensive backs from from Jordan Davis and Benoson. I mean, again, I have it in my notes here. Like every time the guy, like it seems like when he is the player that a receiver is going up against or a quarterback is throwing on, like that's when the throw is perfect. <laughs> and like a couple of the times he, there were slant three, like man, he's right there. How does the guy? How does he catch the ball? But then you watch Marvin Harrison get mugged by Kalen King and still catch the ball. And so you're like, oh, I guess receivers are actually good too. Um, all things considered, I, I really believe maybe we found that Davis and Igbenosin's best spot is on the boundary as opposed to the field, but maybe because Denzel Burke is so good on the boundary that you just have to deal with it. I, maybe you see now where next year Igbenosin, because he's allowed to be a touch more physical on the boundary side, maybe he slides into that spot pretty easily. It, it's worth thinking about. I, th- I think I, I think mostly I, I would be emboldened by the idea that because I, I actually – I don't know if I'm in the minority there. So now, like, I think Davis and Nick has been pretty good all year. Yeah, um, it's been good. So, but like, he's I been great. Yeah, yeah, that, that, which I think is right. You've said that a few times, and I and I agree with it. Um, but it's good to see him have that flexibility, I guess, because it did feel like in that game they were. I know he said during the week, like, we don't play boundary and field; we just play left and right. And it made me want to go back and watch all the previous games, I think, to see if I was wrong, but I didn't um, because I don't want to prove myself wrong. But then in that game, um, it did feel like they were flipping boundary and field like fairly often, didn't it? 
Yeah, I don't remember seeing it any other way, uh, to be honest. I mean, I saw Jermaine Matthews out there on both sides, but I didn't see Egg Benoson out there on other on other side. So I don't know if I just happened to miss that or or what. But yeah. um, overall, I mean, uh, again, saying Perry Eliano deserves some credit for the safety development is fair. I thought people were brutally unfair to Tim Walton a year ago, considering the situation that Ohio State had injury wise at cornerback and the lack of depth that he received when he took over in Columbus. Uh, problem solved. That group is sensational right now, and they're going to get better. It was a huge, huge day recruiting wise for Ohio State. They firmly believe that they are the number one team on the list for five star cornerback Devin Sanchez in the class of 2025. And you add Aaron Scott and Bryce West and Miles Lockhart to a group next year that's going to have a very good Davis and Igbenosin, a now extremely confident and ready to go Jermaine Matthews, Kelvin Simpson, like. That that's a lot of reason for Ohio State fans to think that the the, the little dry spell between 2020 and 2022 should be over at the at corner. I was one of those people who was critical of Tim Walton last year. Yeah, I told you then you were stupid. You, you sure did. You were right. He is he is earning that paycheck on and off the field for sure. So uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll own being wrong on that one. He's doing a great job. He's probably is he their best assistant coach? At the moment, if you take like uh, Jim mean, Knowles as coordinator out of the equation, like position coach. I mean, I, I've this year it's it's arguable. This I mean, year, I, yeah, this year. I mean, I obviously, obviously Brian, Brian Hartline, is, Brian Hartline yeah, Brian earned his uh, stripes, but it, I think what we've seen development wise and recruiting wise this year and the play wise this year, um, it is not much of a argument for me. I think that's true. All right, shall we talk about the quarterback? Is there a Lincoln Geno package coming up? <laughs> I'm dead serious. I think there needs to be. Do you not? Do you not think next week? Let's say Ohio State goes to Madison and the game goes out. Figures like we think it will, right? Thirty-four to ten, Ohio State wins something like that. Do you not play Lincoln Keenholz in that game if you get into the red zone and give him a shot to do some things? He's got four games to play. Why would you? <sighs> so, part- or, do you, or do you just say, Kyle, you need to figure this out. Get healthy down there. Yeah, like I would like to see Kyle do it, I guess. Um, Lincoln Keenholz is 200 pounds. He, now, the reason they want to use Devin Brown down there is because Devin Brown, I think, can be pretty powerful running the football at times. And like he he came so close to running over a guy and scored a touchdown. I actually think on that play, if he did not he get hurt, ball, if he didn't get hurt and scream in pain, he would have he would have yeah. he would have put but even if he did get hurt and scream in pain, if he had the ball on his right shoulder. Yeah. Instead of his left, he still scores. I wrote that in my notes too. Um, I think he's running so powerfully that he just twisted his ankle off mm. because th- he was torquing so hard to get into the end zone um, that he almost, uh, you know, I, I, if it's only a sprain, I think he got away. He's lucky because that could have been a lot worse. Yeah, I, I guess color me skeptical on that initial reporting. Well, we were, I guess yeah. we won't get an update. I don't know. We'll see what Ryan Day says about it um, this week. Uh, I mean, I like I like the idea of quarterback run game in the red zone. Like, I think they need it. If you're going to tell me like Kyle McCord is not the guy to do that, I would probably agree with you. But I I don't know that there's a tremendous gap between Devin Brown's running ability and Kyle McCord. So like, I think you can try it with Kyle. Um, but if you want to try it with Lincoln, I guess you can. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Like Lincoln's a freshman. I don't know if you want to do that with a true freshman in Madison, Wisconsin, for the first time. Yeah. If you if you want to do it, like can Tristan Jebbia do it? Like I, I don't know. That's why I'm saying you do it if you have a if the game flow is going the way that you think and it's comfortable. But as you said in the parking lot on Saturday night, walking to our cars after the game, there is one other answer that Ohio State should consider deploying inside of the red zone. And Bill, why don't you just tell the people what it is? Uh, I regret saying this out loud. I asked Berm. It's, we, it's as, a it's the right decision. As we were walking, we were almost to the car. Like I, I, I almost ran out of time to say it, and I said, "Hey, you think they could use Cam Martinez as a red zone quarterback?" And you almost yes, fainted <laughs> because it's a, it's a very good answer for all sides, all parties. Cam Martinez is dynamic with the football in his hand. He's touched it one time in his Ohio state career and he returned it for a touchdown on a, on a, on a pick six. So like at this point, are there things that you don't consider if you're Ohio state? I mean, no, you're, you're putting Caden Curry in the backfield mm-hmm. for Pete's sake. And I and love he Caden plays. Curry. You use him like Cam Martinez yeah, is doing nothing. I, I love Caden Curry, uh, but it seems like he just falls down through the line of scrimmage most of the time rather than actually blocking someone. And I love the guy, but yeah. Um, Kyle McCord, man, I don't know. I asked him after the game, like, how close do you think this offense is to getting it, to being there? And 
he mentioned it's just the little things, right? It's, it's sometimes it's him, sometimes it's the receivers dropping balls, and there were two more, three more drops in this game, two of them by Marv. You're like that. I just don't understand it. Like, how's that happening? Xavier no, Johnson. I don't know if I, I don't know if I put those on him. Oh, yeah, I maybe one, not the screen. Do, do you think Marvin? No, that one. I, I, that was not even considered a drop. That was not even in there. That that one he that's a Kyle issue because the lineman got the defensive lineman got up the field faster than he thought and he forced it and probably put too much zip on it. But there was there were two other ones that Marv dropped and Xavier Johnson drops one on the first drive of of the yeah. second half. Um, I I don't. There's all these little things. The offensive line when they break down they break down in a major way. Uh, they don't. But all of that starts with the quarterback, and if the quarterback is in rhythm, if the quarterback is throwing. The ball where it needs to be. If the quarterback is stepping up, you know, Ohio State had a what play was it? It was in the third quarter. Sorry. I, I know this isn't great YouTubing, but um, where is that? Uh, this is Ohio State fourth quarter. Third and three from the 19 is where he forced it to, to Julian Fleming down at the goal line and is incomplete. Like he steps up in the pocket and there's there is an opportunity there to just scramble for three yards. And Maybe he would have got it. Maybe he wouldn't have. He had Donovan Jackson out in front of him in one defender and another guy flanked off to his left that maybe could have dragged him out from behind, but like it's three yards. And so I, I think you just want to see that little extra. And this is a kid who starts the game five for five, then goes one for his next seven, completes 11 of his 14 passes in the second half. One of them is a, a drop that, uh, you know, Xavier should have had. So now you're talking 12 of 14. He also throws a, a really excellent ball on on the second and thirteen pass to Julian Fleming that gets called back because of a hold, or, or and so that now all of a sudden like I, I asked this last week and it's a hypothetical slash whatever, but do you want a quarterback who's really good in the first quarter or the fourth quarter? And I I think you still want a guy who's really good in the fourth quarter, but you just can't have a guy who seems totally out of step with the offense in the first quarter and that's what the comic Accord has been yeah i think i think joel Klatt said it right on the fox broadcast that it felt like kyle was just sped up a lot early in the game um i think like throwing the ball all like out of sync with with receivers routes and certainly off target at times um but then also just just like not not seeing the full picture i i, I don't think and like i know i think someone pointed out like the, on this, the fade, the slot fade to Carnell Tate, like Marvin Harrison was wide open. Like he, he ran a crossing route. There was no one near him. Um, yeah. But even so that I, play should have been a touchdown to Carnell Tate. If he throws it to the back of the end right. zone instead of throwing it at the front of the end zone. Yeah. I he thought that was the right to, decision. It was just a bad throw. Right. Yeah. He yeah. had Carnell uh, in the second quarter with or, or the third quarter down the seam, which a, it's a touchdown. If he throws it where it needs to be, mm -hmm. um, is that those are things you can't have happen. And that was, it, it's, you don't want to overlook the things he does well. First drive of the game, for example, Carnell Tate falls down on a, on a route and he finds chip training on the little crosser for the big pickup on, uh, like that's a, it's a good adjustment. He, he knows he's where he's supposed to be, but the throw to like, I keep going back to the throw to Carnell because not the first one, not the first drive because yeah, Martin, the second one, that is a 70-yard touchdown pass in, in a back-breaking play if he throws it where it needs to be. And I only bring it up because in high school, and I know high school is not college football, not Big Ten football, the reason Ohio State opted for Kyle McCord over J.J. McCarthy was because the belief was that Kyle McCord is a much more accurate thrower of the football. And it's interesting to me that he seems to have some difficulty with his accuracy now and I don't know if it's just timing or if it's accuracy. And I think a poorly timed route can look inaccurate, um, but and also just an inaccurate throw can be inaccurate. So I don't know which one it's more of. I think sometimes it's his feet um, that he's not getting in both feet underneath him. He's throwing off a back foot. He's he's you know not not throwing in rhythm. I think that shows up and he does lose his accuracy. I thought too the 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 incredible catch by Kate Stover on the head of the linebacker. Yeah, if that if that throw is out ahead of Kate Stover, it's middle of the field open, split safeties. I think Kate catches that ball and just runs right between the safeties for a touchdown. Yeah, it's it is a stark reminder, especially with CJ Stroud in the building on Saturday, yep. of the yep. difference between what a a guy who is excellent at putting a ball placement 
versus a guy that's still trying to figure that out. CJ Stroud was so light years ahead of where most quarterbacks are ever in their life in that regard. But it, it shows up in a big way when you're watching a college quarterback that isn't CJ Stroud. And I, I was thrilled to see the way that the crowd reacted to him in the stadium on Saturday. I asked CJ walking off the field. I said, Hey, uh, don't you wish they would have cheered like this for you when you were actually playing here? <laughs> um, and he said, I understand. Sometimes it's hard to see it when it's right in front of you. And I said, Damn, Oh, wow. You're, you're mature, bro. <laughs> he was uh, just like, side note, he was really good on game day, making the picks, like talking about ball. Like he's going to do that, I think, when he's, when he's done playing. Did you see his, you were up in the box so you couldn't see him, but like he was stalking Ryan Day on the sideline, like everywhere. Like I thought he was like, he was more into the game than a lot of the guys who were dressed for the game were. <laughs> Yeah, I thought there was one point after Kyle, I think, had thrown in a completion where, like, I thought CJ was going to go over and, like, have a conversation with Ryan and Kyle. <laughs> it's like, I don't, I don't know if that's your place or not, but thankfully he didn't do it. Uh, I really more- believe he wanted to come back last year. And once he was told, you're going to go second, then he couldn't. But I, I do think that that was a harder decision than we ever thought. I did. It, uh, I also felt that as well. Um, I want to, so, like, I think you may, like you're right about like and the CJ Stroud comparison I think is apt and it's fitting that that he was there. It's just a different kind of quarterback. It's a more inexperienced quarterback, and that's not to excuse things. It's just more to like explain them. Like he's got some growth to make. Kyle McCord does. I think we see the good. We've seen it on display. There's there's still too much inconsistency there. Um, my biggest thing on this game, like there were missed throws for sure. There were drops where his stat line will look better. Second and twenty two. He stood in the pocket and stared down Carnell Tate with his foot on the one yard line for like three and a half seconds and then got himself sacked. He cannot do that. Like his pocket awareness has to be better than that. That was damn close to being a safety only because it was like Kyle did not, I think, have the proper sense of urgency in the moment. And like I maybe I'm making way too much out of a play that ended up just being a sack and it was harmless and they punted out of it. and It was fine. But in a game like that, I do not think you could hold on to that ball that long and just lock on to one guy on one side of the field and not try to find something else or get out. Like you have to have a faster, faster internal clock than that. No, I think you're right. Um, I think, and I, I can't find it in my notes here, but I know I wrote it. Uh, I'm not sure if it was just a random thought or a per, you know, in inside of a drive thought, but what I've seen out of this Ohio state team. And I think this starts with Kyle and this is why I'm saying everything Everything as far as the minutia of getting a little bit better, which that little bit will take you to the next level for Ohio State. Um, when things go bad for this offense, they go all the way bad. The spiral, yeah. Or they, snowball. You you go from so let me see. So I think it was their third drive. It felt like a touchdown drive was going to happen for Ohio State, and then they just collapsed upon themselves. Um, yeah. So they start the ball with the ball. Inside their own 10, they get four yards on first down, a nice run by Mayan, get two yards on second down, third and four, manageable, complete to Marv, easy. Then you get a false start. Then you get, because they tried to go tempo, which again, it, it's, it's annoying because Ohio State's offense is so much better when they're going tempo, but yet it seems like that's when the offensive line can't contain itself. Mm-hmm. Um, you get a false start, you pick up three yards, then you, End up, so now it's second and 12. You throw a nice ball to Julian Fleming. He fights for a first down. Zach gets called back because of a suspicious holding call that I don't think was a hold on Josh Simmons. I asked you about it on Saturday. Rewatching it now, I still don't think it was. And I have, Neither I said, like, yeah, I don't, I agree. Danny I don't Dennis think it was Sutton holding. Danny Dennis Sutton was holding Josh Simmons to make it look like he was held. And it's a smart play by a, a young defensive end who, you know, side note, like, when you lose Chop Robinson, if you're Penn State, you you bring in a five star recruit and Danny Dennis Sutton, who was really good in this game. Um, and then then Kyle takes the sack, and it's like, holy crap! And now all of a sudden, you go from first and ten at the twenty five yard line to sec- to third and twenty seven from the two. Like, how the hell does that happen? And that's where I think Ryan Day just like loses his mind because he's like, w- that drive that that first couple play sequence. I was like, okay, this is a scoring drive for Ohio State. They they. Yeah. They are getting it going, and then they kill themselves. And fortunately for them, Jesse Murko ends up hitting a punt that um, Daquan Hardy made a big, big mistake on, and it ends up going seventy-two yards, and that changes the. But again, that's one. I, it all starts with Kyle, and he has to be cleaner in those moments. He has to be a guy that understands the moment. And 
even on the fumble that got returned by for a touchdown, it was overturned. Like you can't just have the ball flailing around out there like that. Like you, it's three to three, and you need to score a touchdown. Yeah, that was. I mean, I I do think on that play that the holding that Omar like threw everything off and like Kyle like it did, got, but then pull it down and don't get hit. You can't. Risk yeah, he's loose. He's loose in the, the right football ball. in the pocket. He's absolutely loose with the football in the pocket, and he can't be. Um, especially when your offensive line has some troubles protecting you at times, um, which I do think is affecting him. I think that's part of the reason why he sped up. Like he's sometimes reacting to stuff that I think is not there or expecting stuff that never actually gets there. Um, and then like the flip side of that is like when stuff gets there, he's not always handling it well, which is just like sometimes you're going to get hit. Just make sure you hold on to the ball. Yeah. I would like to know if anyone had a conversation, a conversation. conversation. Where am I from? Ba- from Chicago? You're getting ready to go to uh, Madison. So let's, Holy let's- moly. Um, did anyone have a conversation with Manny Diaz about what he said, what he was meaning? A couple <laughs> weeks ago? I, no, I don't think he was available post game. No, like, I, I wonder like what, what he was actually, uh, cause it's not like they were poor against Ohio state. So I want to know like what he actually was talking about. Cause, yeah. uh, but anyway, we could, we could beat the quarterback stuff to death. Bottom line, Craig Krenzel won a national championship for Ohio state. Um, Ohio State won a national championship in 2014 with their third string quarterback after not knowing who their starting quarterback was going to be in spring and fall camp because of Braxton's injury. Like Tom McCord does not have to be the best quarterback in the country for Ohio State to win a national championship. Absolutely. Yep. But he can't lose them games. And he hasn't to this point, but he almost did on Saturday. And that's the the when you find yourselves in these talent equated games. One mistake can end your game. And it was this close to being Common Court who made it. And those are the things that, you know, just can't happen. Uh, would you like to make an impassioned speech on behalf of Dallin Hayden as we move the running backs? Or are you or are you not? No, there? I mean, I, I'm gonna be honest with you. I rewatched this game on on Sunday. I watched the game in person on Saturday. I don't know how Ohio State's running stats are this bad for this game because I thought they actually ran the ball pretty well. The first like, half, I, I, I think they definitely did. I yeah. think they did even through the third quarter, Bill. Like uh, it's they they what they what they did, and I think this impacts the statistics quite a bit. There were like four or five times where it's first down and you lose five yards from four yards on running plays on first down. I I just don't know where how you do that so much. I mean, they have it's fourth quarter. The Buckeyes get the ball after the Penn State goes forward on fourth and seven uh, with seven minutes to go. The first play, Mayan Williams is a run play. He loses three yards, but they get a face mask penalty, which negates the the loss. And then the next play, they run Xavier Johnson on an end around to a side of the field where there's no lead blockers because there's no receivers out there. And they lose three yards on that first down play. So it's like, I, it's, I thought that Mayan Williams ran the ball pretty well. I thought that Chip Trainum, um showed the, the little difference between him and Mayan. There was one run, especially in the fourth quarter, where he picked up five yards on back-to-back plays. Uh, the first one, Mayan probably only gains a yard on the second, you know, but Chip got five. I, I want Dallin to play. I don't know why he's not, but I don't think that the running game issues in this game were because of the running backs. Uh, Mayan, I think, has a bit of an identity crisis. Like when, when he feels like I have to be the man for some reason, like just run forward and get three yards. That's, yeah. that's what you're supposed to do. Um, and he, but I, I don't know. I didn't think they were bad, but does that mean Dallin shouldn't play? Hell no. Dallin should be playing. I don't, I don't understand the decision not to. Yeah, that's where I am. I don't know. I don't know that playing Dallin changes much of anything in this game. It's just weird to me that he's not playing, right? We, we, why can't you use three backs? We definitely we don't have Travion Henderson, and the redshirt thing is stupid. Why don't you? Why just just play him? If, you, if, if just see if he can give you a spark, like you know, I, I, like ride the when you have this kind of depth, I think it's okay to like throw different guys out there, see if someone can get hot. And like early on, it looked like Mayan was running like last year, healthy Mayan. Um, and then in the second half and a couple of other times, like he he did kind of show that tendency to bounce runs a little too much, I think. And that's just not not where he belongs. Um, I thought Chip was probably knocking a little bit of, of rust off, maybe if they're like missing half a game basically against Purdue. But I thought he was fine. I mean, Chip Chip's both of those guys averaged fewer than three yards a carry. So like there wasn't there wasn't yeah. a, a ton there. Um, but I I I, I kind of thought Ohio State ran the ball too much in this game. <laughs> like um and and didn't have a ton of run game diversity in this game. Like they they got something going a little bit with some inside zone plays early in the game and just like kept running them. And Penn State was like, Oh, you're just gonna keep doing this. I guess we'll sell out yeah. and stop it. And then just like kept sending defensive tackles and linebackers and safeties through gaps at the snap of the ball and, and blowing stuff up. Like I don't I this felt 
less like personnel stuff and more like Ohio State, I think, being fairly content, just kind of keeping it basic, even if it wasn't particularly effective. Yeah, and they ran a little speed option to mine, which uh, it picks up five yards. But that's actually a nice play because it's new, you know. So like, just yeah. But I also thought to- Travion would have scored on that play. <laughs> right? Maybe Dallin would have. Yeah. I mean, maybe Chip would have. I just, it, I, I think there's ways, especially once you lose Devin Brown, right? Like, and you go into the red zone next time. Why not try putting Dallin in there in the Wildcat? Like, do you not do those? I mean, if you want to equalize numbers, like, let's run some Wildcat stuff. Let's figure out a way to. To give the running back a little bit of a head start. Um, uh, overall, like I don't think again, I don't think the running backs were the problem with the running game in this. I don't think the offensive line was particularly a problem in the running game. I do tend to think you're right that they just ran too much because, especially because, I mean, I don't know if you saw it on the TV copy or heard it on the TV copy. Jenny uh, Jenny Taff was talking, and after one of Kyle McCord's overthrows or where he came off the field, and Ryan Day told him, "Calm down, they can't cover us." Yeah. Like, which they was couldn't. true. They could. The receivers were open wall game, and so I, I don't know. I, I think it's one of those things where we talked about it last Tuesday from the Woody. Sometimes Ryan Day gets into his head a little bit and thinks that a game has to be tight just because people say it needs to be a close game. And you look at this game; it's twenty to six Ohio State at that point in the after it really should have been like a 30 to six type of game, and it shouldn't have even been close. Yeah, like I, I, I'm trying to get less hung up on whatever the final number is in Ohio State's points column, especially in a yeah. game like this. Like there there is nothing wrong with running the ball, trying to hold on to it, playing a little keep away, and playing amazing defense and winning a game against a team like Penn State that way. Nothing yeah. wrong with it at all. It's just like the run plays weren't working. <laughs> so like yeah. run different ones maybe, try some different ones, maybe th- maybe sprinkle in a little bit more run like they were they were like needlessly inefficient i feel like at times um yeah, especially they their their final offensive drive of the game was exactly that it is needlessly inefficient they get the ball back from penn state with two minutes and 45 seconds to go and run it into the middle of the field three times without trying like you hold the ball they end up kicking a field goal that they miss and allows penn state to score a touchdown all you have to do is get one first down and the game's over, game over yeah. like try to do something else and I, the defense was very upset that they gave up a touchdown, especially because they knew that in that last situation, they were going to be told to just go out there and, and play soft, which they hadn't done all game. So um, I don't know. I, I'm not going to blame the running backs. I, I don't think that they were bad. I think that it's clear that Ohio State, without Travion Henderson and with the refusal to play down, Hayden lacks some explosion in the, in the run game. And bottom line, when you look at this offense, you do this without your most explosive running back. You do it without your most... Uh, reliable receiver in Emeka Buka, and I say that without any sort of tongue in cheekness. At this point this season, Emeka Buka has been more reliable catching the ball than Marvin Harrison, but Marvin just catches it because he gets it thrown to him sixteen times a game. He's he's dropped like seven balls this year. Okay, let let's call it what it is. That's it's weird for Marvin Harrison to drop seven passes. Um, yeah. Emeka has dropped one that I'm aware of, so I, I think he's been. I thought Doug made a really really great point on the post game show about this offense. And you think about the Notre Dame game and the two guys that were the standouts of that game offensively for Ohio state that made the difference. Here we are four weeks later and Ohio state had to win against a very damn good Penn state offense without Trayvon Henderson and without a Mecca Buka and were able to do it. So um, I think you can be happy just knowing that, Hey, we got we scored 20 points, won this game defense was lights out and, and you move forward. Like, uh, but, I know that our job here is to, you know, be a little bit more hype, uh, critical, uh, critical eye, but I don't think it was the running backs. Bottom line, uh, Amika does have one drop this this year, by the way. Um, no, yeah, yeah. he had he had one, right? That was yeah, against Notre Dame. He has one. Yeah. Um, no, I think everything you said is right. I guess one last point on the run game. Maybe we'll talk about it more. When we get the offensive line, but I was surprised at the lack of play action passing in this game, and I like that's a way to protect your run game. Like if you're going to run, get and run looks, and then just actually run the ball every time. Teams are going to tee off on that. Um, I think they ran like one pistol play action pass play in this game, maybe one or two others that are like a, an RPO sprinkled here or there. I think Ryan Day, Brian Hartline, Justin Fry, everyone involved with it probably should do a better job of, of setting up their run game for success by sprinkling some more play action passing. They didn't really do that much in this game. Um, yeah. Receivers, as I said earlier, I felt like they were open the entire game. What'd you think? I agree. They were. Um, 
I thought Julian Fleming would have had a touchdown in the for in the second quarter if he didn't get held in a in a really bad way that didn't yeah, get that called. Was a bad, bad knock off. Um, yeah. I thought that uh, Parnell Tate. It, I think his diving catch over the middle was one of the bigger plays of the game because it was it reminded me of it reminded me of C.J. Stroud a year ago, which is. As the quarterback at Ohio State, you can afford to throw the ball in places that most teams can't possibly catch it. And so as long as you put it in in a zone where only your guy can catch it, more often than not, they're going to. And I think you need to not be afraid to do that. I I would love to see, I'm gonna, it's going to sound crappy because he's block O and he's does, does a lot of good things. But like if I want to see Brandon Innes running the plays that, Xavier Johnson's running right now. I just don't think he's as explosive as um, he has been. I don't know if there's a reason for that or if it's just because, as Austin has said before, like every time he's on the field, it's like people know there's a gadget play coming to him in some way, and I think you can mix it up. But um, I think that between Marv, I mean, 16 targets is a new career high. He had 13 each of the last two weeks. Uh, I know that... Kyle's going to throw to him 15 times a game from here on out. And I, I'm fine with that. I yeah, mean, you should. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think see anything wrong with that. Um, if he's got one on one coverage, and that's what Kyle said post game was like, if, if I see Marv against anyone, man on man to man, I'm going to throw him the ball. And cool, totally fine with that. Um, it does mean on time, sometimes the other receivers, receivers may not get the production you want, but I think that's the unfortunate part when you see Fleming on a, on a vertical route. Where he's held so badly that it uh, doesn't get called, but um, nothing to complain about. I thought the wide receivers, blocking wise, did a good job in this game on the outside. Um, that's why, again, I sometimes I wonder why you run to the other side where they're not there. But maybe that's just a mixed direction. Cardinal T did miss a block on a third down swing pass to Mayan Williams. Um, yes, that was a bad one. Yeah, but other than that, I think you're right. Uh, is it is it missing a block if you didn't touch anyone or try to? <laughs> Like it's a fair point. He did not miss a block. He just didn't block somebody. <laughs> I didn't attempt to block. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought they were all really good. And I like Marvin. Uh, if Marvin got, I don't know, I would say he probably won like 90% of his routes against no matter like Kalen King or Johnny Dixon. The one play Johnny Dixon made, like knocking the ball away from Marvin on a slant, I thought if that ball was on Marvin's other shoulder or on his body, it would have been a completion and not, and not instead of on his back shoulder where the hand or already was. Out in front of him. Yeah. 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 So like that was a good play by Johnny Dixon. But like I thought, I thought Marv cooked both those guys. Like, and Kalen King is going to be a first rounder that I don't think he could, he could have covered Marv. Like, and he was moving, traveling with Marvin when Marvin was in the slot early on. Kalen King was on him. Didn't matter wherever Marv was, and Kalen King was there. Marv won every time. Um, which and it was like a repeat of last year against Penn State when he was doing it to Joey Porter Jr. and Kalen King. Like that dude's special, man. Like I know he has the drops, and they're frustrating. And he and you expect more of a guy who's supposed to be the best receiver in the country. But I, I think he is reminding us why we think of him that way these last few weeks. He's really turned it on. Like I think he he had like. Uh, I don't know, like 11 catches or something like that on his first three games or first four games. And he's got like 25 in the last or 30, I think in the last three games, it's something crazy like that. Like he's, he's looking like Marv again. It's interesting because much like JT to him, uh, for Mike Yersich, it appears Manny Diaz did not learn a lesson from a year ago. And I, I, we were, we were, we were talking to Marv upstairs and I said, were you surprised that they were playing like man coverage on you early in the game? And he said, no, 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 no. I know they're confident in their defensive backs. And I'm like, but and he's like, they have no reason to be. And I said, what about 10 catches for a buck 86 a year ago? Like, is that not enough to make you go? Maybe we shouldn't try this. And he said, oh, well, <laughs> like, I mean, that's, it's, it's weird. Uh, I think that I, I appreciate that sort of moxie for Manny Diaz and his defensive backs to feel like yeah. they can do it, but um, you can't and you shouldn't try. Um, so kudos. Yeah. I mean, they, they have good corner. I'm, I'm sure if, if, Ohio State. And you can do that against ninety nine percent of the receivers in the country, just not that one. Just not that one. Yeah, yeah. I think Jim Knowles would, would feel similarly about his quarterbacks that they were in a, in, a, in a same kind of matchup. But thankfully for them, it only happens in practice. So, um, I don't think I had anything else on receivers. Um, no, tight ends are good. I mean, sober. I thought the blocking was a little like iffy. I think it was at times. I also think there were times where, like, Mayan Williams had a run up the middle where he decides to bounce it outside instead of following where Stover was. Um, uh, yeah, counter counter play. Yeah. yeah. So like, again, I don't know. Uh, we don't always know where that blame actually lies because you could make an argument that he'd missed the guy because he didn't 
keep riding him to the outside, but who who knows? Um, well, the defender oh, knew where Mayan was going because he could see him and Cade couldn't because he doesn't have eyes in the back of his head. Yeah, correct. Um, it, it is a situation where if we headed into the season and talking about Cade Stover as maybe the second most important player on the offense, I don't think anyone would have predicted that. Um, but he's been great and that in the passing game and um, it's okay. I mean, I don't expect, I, I know at Ohio state, like the expectation is that the tight end is a sixth offensive lineman, but if you want a tight end that catches the ball, maybe that's not how it works sometimes. Yeah. No, I mean, I have, I have, I have no notes on Kate as a receiver. He's an excellent receiver and uh, has been very important to them, especially these last couple or game and a half, I guess, without or two game, two and a half games without a Mecca Buka. Um, Kate's been great. That, that, I mean, it's worth mentioning again that catch on the helmet of the linebacker was incredible um yeah. and then he had a couple nice runs after the catch too like he's you can see all the work he's put in to be to be a better receiver this year and like i don't i don't know that he's like a worse blocker than he was last year i also think too like the, the nature of the tight end position like when you miss a block it shows up <laughs> pretty pretty glaringly because you're sort of on an island by yourself out there the, the one block that i like I guess take the biggest issue with was on the third down run down near the goal line. Like the safety just knifed under Cade and like blew up that play. And yeah, but why are they doing that? You start with no, it's your, fair. Yeah, yeah. You start in a T formation with G and and Mayan and Cade, Caden Curry. and you have Caden Curry lined up at tight end, and then you just decide to flip everyone around and go. No, now we only have one blocker and two tight ends. Ha ha, we got you. And then you, ah, I don't know, man. It's yeah, I also a, thought on that play, like at the point of attack there, like Luke Montgomery was there and um Cade was there, and it felt like there were like there were some guy, like two guys going to block one, and I think there was just not really a hole there for mine that yeah, went through. I, I think that there's a just I mean this is a good time to push into the offensive line. Yeah. Even like Mayan's rushing touchdown, which is a great singular effort by Mayan Williams to pick up those two yards. If you look at that play. Uh, Caden Curry is beyond the line of scrimmage and down by the goal line. G Scott is down by the goal line and the entire offensive line is still at the three yard line. So I like, there's no push to get that. It's a two yard run and the entire offensive line is still at the line of scrimmage and nobody's moving forward. I don't, I don't know if it's meant to be blocked that way. It looked like there was some, some slant blocking and stuff like that that was supposed to be going on. But like, I just don't feel like that push in that, in that moment. And it's frustrating because there were a lot of times in this game when the offensive line was getting a push, and I thought they did a really nice job, especially in the second quarter, the f the first seven or eight minutes of the second quarter. They were mm -hmm. dominant. And then, as you said, like they kept kind of running the same play, and Penn State's good enough and smart enough and has good enough athletes to say, okay, if you're just going to keep doing that, we'll, we'll, we'll stop it. So, I don't know. I, I thought overall, though, like if, I, if we're giving like a plus or minus or better or worse, I think this is a better performance. Uh, from the offensive line, even over the Purdue game, when it may not look like it in the stat book, but I thought they were at times very, very good in this game. I my my thought on the offensive line is this: like it was not um, the prettiest game I've ever seen, but it was somewhat significantly better than I thought it was going to be. Like I really thought that this game could get away from Ohio state with Penn state's front against Ohio state's offensive line. And I'm envisioning a world where Josh Simmons and Josh Fryer are routinely getting smoked by Penn state's really good defensive ends. That didn't happen. And it didn't happen in a game where Ohio state did not play a ton of 12 personnel. I thought they were going to play 12 personnel with two tight ends almost exclusively, if only to help those tackles against this pass rush. And honestly, like they played 12 personnel like six times on 70 something plays. And a few of those were down like in a short red zone when they're trying to get big and, and run the ball. I'm not saying that Josh Simmons and Josh Fryer played awesome games, but and they did give up some stuff, but it wasn't like a liability, I, I don't think. I, I think more of, of the offense getting bogged down and not scoring more than it should have was other stuff, at, le at least not pass protection. Um, maybe maybe run blocking. The run blocking, I thought, would get a little iffy in the second half of that game, but yeah. I, I thought like... I, I still don't know what the ceiling for this offensive line is. I, I I don't I don't know that they're at it, or maybe they are. And this is this is what they are. But I thought it could have been a real problem for them in this game, and and it wasn't. And like I mean that as a compliment. Like I, I, I they could have lost in the game, and they did not. I thought both sacks that Ohio State surrendered were on Tom McCord holding the ball too long. Um, which, whatever. I mean, it happens. It's better than forcing a throw, I guess, sometimes, or or throwing another um, intentional grounding when you're already ten yards deep. 
Um, I, I, I thought overall um, that Josh Simmons and Josh Fryer played a pretty good game. I mean, again, I don't think people should under... Uh, this is one thing, and Doug also mentioned this on the, on the post-game show. There's a tendency, I think, for people, once Ohio State beats an opponent, to say, oh, well, they weren't any good. Uh, who, who, who cares how... Like, that Penn State defense is really good. Mm-hmm. And um, the fact that Ohio State was able to pretty much play them to a stalemate with the offensive line versus the defensive line. It was, it's a win. Like that's a win. It's a much better performance from the offensive line than we saw against Maryland. It's a much, it, it, it's probably um, a better performance than we saw against Notre Dame. And the past is, uh, so I, I don't see, I see, I see improvement. Now there are plays where like Ohio state had the ball in the fourth quarter um, at the seven yard line of their own seven yard line, where Donovan Jackson just got whipped by a guy in my and ch- trip chain yes. and been taken off. Mm-hmm. Um, like that, you can't have that happening from of all guys, Donovan Jackson. Like it, that for, that moment reminded me of the Iowa game a year ago, where it's like you had a chance there, and this is different because CJ fumbled and, and Jack Campbell picked it up for a touchdown. Then, um, fortunately, Chip didn't fumble the ball, but that's a moment where you let that guy go and bad things can happen really bad things um but overall i think the offensive line played fairly well like if i was going from a week to week chart like they're up in the, in my mind after this game yeah I, I that's probably fair i'm i'm at the very least like neutral i guess on, on it like i don't i don't think it was a step back like that was every single person to talk about this game coming into it who thought penn state had a sh- like a legitimate shot to win it was because of this matchup it was ohio state's offensive line against penn state's defensive line and like that's fair. Like I thought the same thing. I didn't. I didn't. I picked Ohio State to win because I thought Penn State just didn't have enough on offense, and that turned out to be true. But I also don't think that that this offensive line like let the game get away from them. And and I guess there's the caveat out there that Chop Robinson, the defensive end for Penn State, got hurt in the first half of the yeah. game. But I he thought, got hurt, and, and not to be uncouth, but he got hurt because Matthew Jones crumpled him. Yeah. No. Right. No. I think I think you're right. And, and prior to that, like I don't know. I think there was a play where maybe Chop like drove Josh Simmons back into the quarterback on one play, but um. Like he it's not like Chop Robinson had four sacks in this game before he got out of it. And I did like deny Dennis Sutton and Adisa Isaac or like all three of those guys are really good players. Abdul Carter, linebacker, is an excellent pass rusher and a disruptive guy. And like they made some plays and there were some individual breakdowns on runs. You mentioned Donovan Jackson's. I thought Matt Jones had one. Carson Hinson probably had two or three. Um but it wasn't every snap. Like I thought they were good enough. Like they I think you, they, you got what you needed out of them in this game to win it, obviously. Yeah, I think we need to acknowledge that Penn State's defense is really good. And when you're playing really good players, sometimes you're going to make mistakes and they're going to force you to make mistakes. But if they don't compound, and that's what I said earlier, like Ohio State, when the offense has a series that goes bad, it compounds in that series. They do a really good job of not letting that compound into an entire game issue. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, that's a sign of a mature group. Some of that, I think, has to, you know, be because of Matt Jones and, and Donovan Jackson and Donovan who went through some bad, bad times a year ago. Um, you'd think he maybe has a better handle on how to bounce back from that, but uh, it could have been a situation where you get sacked on the second drive of the game and it's things start to snowball and it didn't happen. So um, overall, I, I pretty happy with that. Now you got to build on it. You got to take yeah. that move forward. You have five weeks to get ready for now the next wave of this is the best defense you're going to face all year. So you got a lot. Ryan Day and Justin Fry said they were simplifying things heading into the pen, into the Purdue game. That seems to be working. Now you have four weeks to, to make sure that uh, you are not just competent at doing the simple things, but you are competent at handling the um, extravagant things because Michigan's offense, defensive front is a much more powerful group than Penn State's is. And that's where I think Ohio State is a little bit suspect, like just a power rush. Um, but we'll see. Yeah, and it'll be not not a test per se, but like if they're not they can't pull back and like ease up going on the road now to Madison. Like Luke Fickle's a good defensive coach. There are some good individual talents on that defense. You're on the road. It's at night. I think that crowd will be pretty pretty juiced up for for that game, even though it was constant Halloween season. weekend lubricated. Yeah. yeah, lubricated for sure. Um, they don't have like the last time they had a, an emotional big time win against Notre Dame. They had the benefit of being off the following week to kind of reset. After that, they do not have that. Now, um, maybe that's better. Uh, I, I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, but it's a different dynamic than the last time they got a win like this. So they got to they got to bring it again next week um, up in Madison. Uh, anything else, Burn? Before we wrap up this episode of the Daily, uh, special teams. 
Uh, I actually really like Jaden Ballard as a punt returner because I think he. I like that he's willing to take some shots. Uh, I don't like the fact that he thinks it's okay to catch a punt over your head. Um, <laughs> that's a bad thing. I don't. You know, his decision to not catch the punt that ends up hitting Lorenzo Styles. And maybe he didn't want to run up and catch it, and maybe that's fine. But you just got to be, I don't know. I, I guess I didn't see, can't hear how vocal he is on the field, but didn't do a great job of, of directing, but then it's just a bad bounce. I think ironically, like the fact that Daquan Hardy let a ball go over his head ends up turning the game in the third quarter because that punt from Mirko was good, but a 50-yard punt versus a 72-yard punt is a big difference. Um, yeah, nice roll there. Uh, obviously, Obviously, you miss a field goal at the end of the game, a 44-yarder. That it's seems like a pretty easy kick, uh, but you, college kickers, man. Hashtag. Yeah, he made he made the ones when the game was in the balance, which yeah. is more important. Um, yeah. So first miss. Of I the do year. think Ohio State special teams. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, like they're playing with fire. They were close a couple times. In this Two game. kickoff returns, man. Like, yeah. <laughs> someone's going to return a kick on them if they don't if they don't kick that thing out of the end zone every time. Like, yeah, they're just not they're not uh i don't know what they're not they're not well coached i guess I, I don't know like they're they're just not they're not particularly sound on special teams or, or like it's, there's weird it's, weird it's, a, it's an intrinsic flaw in the design bill if you send everyone to one side of the field but then you kick it to the middle or the other side and all the guys that are running down one side are getting blocked who who is going to the other side of the field like how do you expect that not to how does it, how do you expect that not to work it's in the lord's hands at that point yeah. Just hope he helps you out. Bad idea. I don't <laughs> care about special teams. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's I, I think in a in a at a time when like Ohio State's offense is figuring some stuff out and maybe they're gonna have to win some games where they're not scoring as many points, and it's more about how good Ohio State's defense is and shutting teams down. That makes special teams, I think, more important and and um gives that phase of the game more potential to truly impact things. And it's a little unsettling that Ohio State's not better there. Yeah, there was a very 1998 Michigan State vibe happening when Lorenzo Styles Jr. Uh, ran into that, or that ball ran into the back of his leg. Uh, you're you're not really probably entirely familiar with Ohio State lore, but uh, go back to that one and you'll see what I'm talking about. It was yeah. the impetus for one of the most heartbreaking losses in Ohio State football history. I I, I know that the loss happened. Um, which is enough, I think. It's, it's it's scarred people, as Ryan Day likes to say. Fans, yeah, fans were the scars of that one. That one is burnt on the brain, Bill. Yeah. And when you get a guy hit with the ball on a punt, and you're like, "Oh my God, did that just happen?" Roosters later on Monday. What time? Roosters Monday, eleven forty-five a.m. Um, Kings of the North coming with you and Douglas. That will be on the podcast feed, but also on the Kings of the North YouTube channel. So if you are following the podcast. Um, feel free to also subscribe to Kings of the North. That is where Bill and Doug will do more of their regional stuff, the Northern football conversation. It's also where uh, we have some big plans down the road for for the company and where things go on a daily basis. So, um, you know, please follow along there and give that channel an opportunity to grow. That would be appreciated. Um, but then back to normal week. We got Ohio State, Ryan Day, Jim Knowles on Tuesday. And uh, it's going to be fun. Yeah. Uh, more coverage coming here on the podcast feed. Um, well, Buck IQ later in the week, all the dailies, all the fun stuff, all the snappy J's, everything you come to expect for us from us here on the podcast. But uh, thank you for joining us here for the Monday edition of the daily dissecting a huge win for Ohio state. Like whatever criticisms we might've had, like don't let it take away from the fact that this was a great win for Ohio state to beat a top 10 team uh, in the shoe with great atmosphere. It was a great college football game and another big win for the Buckeyes. Uh, we enjoyed breaking it down here for you for Berm. I'm Bill. We'll talk to you later.